It is not enough to merely hear the Word of God. We must also keep it. We must keep the Word of God. Because no fornicator, no unclean person, no covetous person, which is the serving of idols, hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. So why is it that a man whose soul has been cleaned by means of baptism or by means of a good confession, how is it that that man can end up damned? Seven more unclean spirits would come. He'd be in worse shape than before. And yet, God gave him everything for salvation. How is it that that man could end up in hell? Well, it is because no fornicator, no unclean or covetous person hath inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. And St. Paul describes these as children of darkness. These are children of darkness. They're not children of the light. You were here too for darkness, but now light in the Lord. And St. Thomas Aquinas points out that St. Paul doesn't say here, you were here too for dark some, not that you had darkness in you, but that you were darkness before God gave you the light. But now, now you are light in the Lord. So we must walk as children of the light. And the fruit of the light is goodness and justice and truth. So how is it that fornication and uncleanness and covetousness uh, are contrary to that? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas says, to give a few definitions here, uncleanness designates every impurity against nature, namely when the act is not ordered toward the generation of offspring. So an impurity against nature does not mean that you didn't recycle. It does not mean that. It has nothing to do with environmentalism. It means it has everything to do with how you treat your body. Because the way you treat your body then extends into all these other various things. And the way you treat other people. If you do not treat your body with reverence, you won't treat other people or other things with reverence. So uncleanness designates every impurity against nature. And by that we mean that God has created everything good to be used uh, in the way that it is to be used. But when we misuse things, then if we use them for something they weren't made for, then that becomes sinful. Now then he also, St. Paul also bans avarice in mentioning covetousness. Now, covetousness here is classed with carnal sins. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Covetousness. Covetousness is classed with these other things as a carnal sin. Now, it might be answered, St. Thomas says, that covetousness is opposed to justice, and thus is classed with the kind of sensuality known as adultery. The latter, adultery, is the unjust use of another man's woman, and covetousness is the unjust use of money. And he refers to that as the serving of idols. Well, both of these are the serving of idols. Because in the Old Testament, uh, when one is uh, worshiping idols, that person is called an adulterer. Because they've committed adultery against God. You know, our souls are espoused to God. So if we worship something else, that's adultery against God. So covetousness also is, uh, as St. Thomas mentions, it is the unjust use of money, but it's idolatry because um, money or other things are given the honor that is due to, to God alone. The honor that is due to God alone is given to other things. Now, there might be other things, other sins. Fornication can become an idol, or uncleanness can, be, can become an idol. And we'll get back to that in a moment, when we hear the words of 
Venerable Luis of Granada. These are the things that invite wicked spirits. We who have been cleaned and made whole and made pure and beautiful by baptism, and after that, after a fall by a good confession, we cannot be the dog that returns to its vomit. We cannot be that. Let us listen to what Venerable Luis of Granada has to say, because now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We cannot procrastinate anymore. World war looming, financial collapse looming, disasters in California. Well, what is next? What is coming upon us here? You cannot procrastinate. Venerable Luis of Granada writes about the folly of those who defer their conversion. And he writes this, We know with certainty that there is nothing which a Christian should desire more earnestly than salvation. It is equally certain that to obtain it, the sinner must change his life, since there is no other possible means of salvation. Therefore, all that remains for us is to decide when, when, when shall this amendment begin? Will you say at a future day? I answer, at this present moment. You urge that later will be easier. I insist that it will be easier now. Let us see which of us is right. Before we speak of the facility of conversion, the easiness of conversion, let me, who has assured you that you will live to the time you have appointed for your amendment. You say you will amend your life later. Will you live that long? Do you not know how many have been deceived by this hope? St. Gregory tells us that God promises to receive the repentant sinner when he returns to him, but nowhere does he promise to give him tomorrow. St. Cesarius thus expresses the same thought. Some say, in my old age I will have recourse to penance. But how can you promise yourself an old age when your frail life cannot count with security upon one day? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, I could go to confession tomorrow, therefore I will sin tonight? You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You might die in your sleep, and then where would you find yourself? But even granting that you will live as long as you imagine, will it be easier to begin your conversion now, or some years hence? And to make this point clear, we shall give you a brief summary of the causes which render a sincere conversion difficult. The first of these causes is the tyranny of bad habits. So strong are these that many would die rather than would relinquish them. Would you rather die than relinquish the habit of playing video games? Would you rather die rather than get rid of your cell phone? Would you rather die rather than say that you will never, ever again look at anything you shouldn't be looking at? Or... Would you rather die than commit a mortal sin? Would you rather die in a state of grace than ever do anything to offend God again? The tyranny of bad habits. So strong are these that many would die rather than relinquish them. Hence, St. Jerome declares that a long habit of sin robs virtue of all its sweetness. For habit becomes second nature. And to overcome it, we must conquer nature itself, which is, the greatness, which is the greatest victory a man can achieve. To conquer nature, a vice, a sinful habit. And you might say, well, it's an addiction. If you say it is an addiction, you're excusing yourself. You're giving yourself permission to sin, and you don't have permission to sin. You can't use that excuse. You can't say it's an addiction. That's an excuse. And it's a lie. 
It's a lie. Let's continue. Sin darkens the understanding, excites the sensual appetites, and though leaving it free, sin weakens the will that it is unable to govern us. Now, being the instruments of the soul, what but trouble and disorder can be expected from these faculties in their weak and helpless state? Okay, now this is to encourage us. This is a hard, it's a hard message, but this is to encourage us. So, be patient here. What but trouble and disorder can be expected from these faculties in their weak and helpless state? How then can you think that your conversion will be easier in the future, since every day increases the obstacles you now dread and weakens the forces with which you must combat them? If you cannot ford the present stream, how will you pass through it when it will have swollen to an angry torment? An angry torrent. Perhaps you are now a prey to a dozen vices which you tremble to attack. With what courage, but especially with what success, will you attack them when they will have increased a hundredfold in numbers and power? There are only a dozen today. There will be hundreds in the future. There is only one spirit today, but that spirit will go back and bring seven more, more wicked than itself in the future. You can combat one with great effort. Can you combat all of that in addition? If you are now baffled by a year or two of sinful habits, how can you resist their strength at the end of ten years? Do you not see that this is a snare of the arch enemy who deceived our first parents and who is continually seeking to deceive us also? Can you then doubt that you only increase the difficulties of your conversion by deferring it? Do you think that the more numerous your crimes, the easier it will be to obtain a pardon? Do you think that it will be easier to effect a cure when the disease will have become chronic? And do not lose sight of the satisfaction God requires for sin, which is so great that in the opinion of St. John Climacus, man can with difficulty satisfy each day for the faults he commits each day. Why then will you continue to accumulate the debt of sin and defer its payment to old age, which can so poor, which can so poorly satisfy for its own transgressions? In old age, we don't have the vigor. We don't have the vigor to to struggle as we do in our youth. St. Gregory considers this the basest treason and says that he who defers the duty of penance to old age falls far short of the allegiance he owes to God and has much reason to fear that he will be a victim of God's justice rather than the object of that mercy upon which he has so rashly presumed. You hope no doubt to be saved. Therefore, you must believe yourself of the number of those whom God has predestined. Will you then wait until the end of your life to serve him who has loved you and chosen you heir to his kingdom from all eternity? Will you be so ungenerous with him whose generosity to you has been boundless? The span of human life is so limited how can you dare to rob this generous benefactor of the greatest part, leaving him only the smallest and most worthless portion? Cursed is the deceitful man, says God, that hath in his flock a male, and making a vow offereth in sacrifice that which is feeble to the Lord. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the Gentiles. This is from the prophet Malachi. There were priests who weren't offering the first fruits. They weren't offering the, the spotless, unblemished lamb. They were taking a lamb from the flock that had a broken leg or something they couldn't sell. They were giving 
not only the second best, but the worst to God. So if we reserve to ourselves the best years of our life and wait until those years that we really don't care so much for and offer those to God, that's treason. We're stealing from God. Therefore, defer not your repentance until old age. Remember, however, that old age is generally what youth has been. For as the sacred writer observes from Ecclesiasticus, how shalt thou find in thine old age the things thou hast not gathered in thy youth? Let me urge you then, in the words of the same inspired author, to give thanks while thou art living and while thou art in health to praise God and glory in his mercies. Delay not, therefore, dear Christian, but make all the haste you can. And if, as the prophet says, you shall hear his voice today, defer not your answer until tomorrow, but set about a work the difficulty of which will be so much lessened by a timely beginning. There we have the words of, of Venerable Luis of Granada in his book, The Sinner's Guide. Nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. <laughs>